Well, good morning, church family. It is good to be back with you. I've missed you over the last couple weeks. Hopefully you have missed me, but here I am. I'm back in the flesh, ready to go. So turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, very, very important passage as we walk through the book of Acts, uh, commonly known as the Jerusalem Council. This morning is also a very important morning in the life of our church, and that is it's the first of the month and we are taking the Lord's Supper together, okay? And so all born-again believers, okay, are welcome to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. You should have gotten the elements on your way in. If you did not, please lift your hand and some deacons will pop up. They will come around and they will make sure that you have these. Uh, Believer, I want you to be preparing your heart and your mind even now throughout the entire service, right? Because the scripture warns us, do not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, right? Prepare your heart. So even now, would you be willing to just ask the Holy Spirit of God to search me? Search my thoughts and my mind and my heart and see if there's anything in me that needs to, that I need to repent from, that I need to turn from. Would you, Father, Would you call that to my mind, okay, so that we can lay that at the feet of Jesus, okay? So be preparing your heart and your mind. We'll come to that at the end. Now, we have a lot of narrative to cover this morning. I'm going to be moving fast, okay? And in fact, this is going to lead us, we're going to be covering, a, a, there's a very important theological topic as you walk through uh, uh, Acts chapter 15, and it involves, do we keep the Mosaic law as Christians, okay? And, and that's going to be covered today, uh, but this question of how the law transfers from the Old Testament into the New Testament is, a, is so important and so complex that next week I'm going to be doing an excursus, an ex- aside. We're going to break from Acts and we're just going to look at that question. How does the law transfer from the Old Testament to the New Testament? But this morning, we're going to be covering a lot of narrative. We're going to be moving quickly, all right? So imagine with me, What life must have been like for the woman in Luke chapter 8, who had been bleeding for 12 years. She was declared unclean by the Mosaic law. In fact, when, when she approached people, it was required that she would call out and say, unclean, unclean, lest Anyone accidentally touch her, and then they too would become unclean. Socially ostracized, unable to go to the temple and to draw near to God and to worship with others. I don't have words to describe what it would be like to go 12 years without normal human touch. No hugs, no holding of hands, not even a simple back rub, completely isolated. Though she had spent all that she had on physicians, she could find no cure until the day she touched Jesus. The power, the spirit of God flowed through her and in an instant she was purified. Jesus, the only one she could touch. All others she made unclean, but she touched him and he made her clean. 
Now, some of you have come this morning and you long to be made spiritually clean. Let me just assure you, you have come to the right place. Let me promise you that God is near. He has sent his son to draw near to you so that he might make you clean. Hold on to this moment right here, this moment of being completely clean and the joy and the freedom of worship that overflows because what we're going to see in our text this morning, okay, is an amazing transformation that Jesus brings to ritual cleanliness and then the worship that overflows, So listen, as I read, I'm going to start by reading the first five verses out of Acts chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them. The brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them, that they should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they they were passing through Phoenicia and Samaria and describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. Now, when they had arrived at Jerusalem, They were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, those who had believed, okay, believers, Christians, but the sect of Pharisees, Christian Pharisees, stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we have gathered together this morning in Jesus' name as your people that your Holy Spirit indwells. We long to gather together to worship your name. You are worthy of all all of our worship. And Father, you are worthy of us coming to you in any way that you might require. Who are we to say to you what what you should require? And yet this morning, your word will teach, Father, that Jesus Christ alone cleanses us and in his name, through faith, as a free gift, we come. And so we stand before you, God. Teach us how to worship you. And we welcome you to search our hearts, find if there is any, any wicked way in us so that we might turn from it, be made right in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There was a buzz in Antioch. The entire church had heard the news that they had gathered together in one of the largest homes that they had in Antioch, one that had an open air atrium, and they were packed in tightly, shoulder to shoulder, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, slave and free man. And they had gathered together on a summer evening because Paul and Barnabas had returned with stories to tell of all that God had done on their missionary journeys, their amazing adventures, the provision that God had provided through shipwreck and through (laughs) robbers and over a thousand miles on foot. Stories of miracles and scars. Remember, Paul was beaten and even stoned. But most importantly, salvations that the grace of God was being received by hundreds, even thousands, mostly Gentiles. They were coming to faith in Jesus. And they would detail what happened in each city, and then they would pause and they would pray together as a church in Antioch for the budding churches in all these other regions. And then as Daniel described last week, Paul and Barnabas 
settled back into life there at the local church in Antioch discipling and maturing and building healthy relationships. Even Peter came and spent some time in Antioch and he longed to hear what God had done amongst the Gentiles. While there, Galatians 2 tells us of a very important public rebuke that Paul gave to Peter. In fact, it becomes vital and the theological significance of what takes place here in Acts chapter 15. See, Antioch was a picture of the church that had never before been seen, where ex-pagan men and women, many of them slaves, had complete equality with Christian Jews. And they lived their lives together at church, in fellowship, and even around the dinner table. And Peter loved it. He was captivated by this unity. There was a regular practice that the early church called the agape meal. On Sundays, the first day of the week, after work, they would meet And they would meet together for a meal. They would share a whole meal as a church. Now, that sounds very Baptist, doesn't it, right? Okay, and some people would bring their own and others would bring enough to share. But they would gather together, they would have this meal, and then they would pray, and then they would take the Lord's Supper together every week. The agape meal. And there is Peter right in the middle of it. And he loves the beauty and the diversity of the scene. And then suddenly, the Christian Pharisees show up. Now, these were Christians, but they were Jews by birth. And they were visiting from Jerusalem, and they supposedly carried the authority of the church of Jerusalem, okay? And as they came, and they show up, and they are appalled by the laxity of the scene. And immediately, they began to campaign, and they go right at Peter. Peter, how could you be eating with Gentiles? This is unbelievable clean and degrading to God. God may meet Gentiles where they are, but he doesn't expect them to stay there. And Peter, you are indulging in filth. What if word got back to Jerusalem? Okay, what if word got back to the church in Jerusalem and they heard what you were doing here? Think about that and get this. Peter and even Barnabas take a step back from eating at that agape meal with the Gentiles and they begin to seclude themselves. They begin to form their own clique, right? Of we are Jewish and we're kosher and we will eat over here because we are clean. And it doesn't take long right? And a fracture runs through the entire church. And by the time Paul hears, he's fuming. Shows up that next Sunday at that agape meal, okay? And he sees it taking place and he stands up and he confronts Peter to his face, He calls him out because it was a public sin. Now there is a public rebuke. Paul stands up in front of everyone. Peter, what are you doing? What are you doing, Peter? This isn't about preference of food. Peter, this is about the gospel This is about, does Jesus make you clean? Only Jesus makes you clean. It's not about what you eat or drink. It's not about what is outside coming in. 
You are acting like the Jews have superior dietary laws. Peter, God gave you a vision about this exactly. There is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free man, for all are one in Christ Jesus. And food of all things does not change that. And right there, the Apostle Peter, the one who gave the sermon at Pentecost, repented. And Barnabas too. In front of the whole church, you're right. Forgive me. It was an important moment of healing for the church as they came back together. And before long, Peter goes back to Jerusalem and they lived happily ever after. You guys ready to close and go home? (laughs) No, right? The controversy is not over because the Christian Pharisees didn't let up. Once Peter left, they only got louder. Now, it's important to understand, historically, if Gentiles wanted to convert to Judaism, okay, there's a term for that, a proselyte. And the first act of obedience was circumcision, according to the law of Moses, okay? Yeah, you can convert your first act of obedience. So, If one wasn't willing to be circumcised, then from their perspective, you are not saved. Look at verse 1. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. But look down at verse 5. Because what they are teaching goes much further than just circumcision. Okay, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed stood up saying, listen, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. You must keep the law of Moses. So let me state this teaching as plainly as I can. Okay, now pay close attention to this. Some of you may be here this morning and you're like, Why does a historical argument in the church that happened 2,000 years ago, what does that have to do with me? Why should I care in the least bit? Okay? Guys, it, it has massive theological implications. Okay? That, that, it, you want to know why there's so many denominations? Well, this is one of the major divides, okay, on what you are to do with the Mosaic law, okay? And there, there are lots of questions in, in the application in terms of the legalism that actually happens in all churches and, and, and as we practice worship, okay? That legalistic thread, it's right here. These, these are very important questions, okay? And if I'm honest, there's, there's been a massive resurgence in, in our current day, even with threads in this church, about do we need to be keeping the Sabbath day and the Mosaic law? Is that something all of us should be doing? Furthermore, on top of that, each of us should be saying, you know what? What is acceptable worship to King Jesus? All right? If, if he has died for us, he is worthy. And, and he tells us how we come to him. Right? If he is holy and he says, you must worship me on your knees, then let's worship him. All right? I want to come to my Lord and Savior however he requires Okay, so God has a word for us this morning about how we are to worship him. Okay, Jesus says, in spirit and truth, the Father is looking for worshipers. All right, so what is this teaching? 
The Christian Pharisees taught that Jesus saves you, yes, by grace. He saves us. He saves us to keep the law of Moses. Okay? He enables us to keep the law. So to accept Jesus is to accept and to follow the law of Moses. In other words, to become Jewish, right? With circumcision and the keeping of the Jewish festivals, right? There's a Jewish calendar of worship. So we need to be keeping the festival of booths and uh, Sabbath, okay? Sabbath is Saturday. You can't change the Saturday to the Sunday. It doesn't work that way. Now, including on all that, the, the Mosaic law is filled with cleanliness laws, okay? And things that you can eat that make you unclean. So do not eat those things. And do not touch. If you touch something unclean, then you become unclean. So do not touch dead bodies. Do not touch anybody with disease, especially skin disease and leprosy. Do not touch any blood or discharge. Anyone? You may not know this, but in the Mosaic law, when a woman is on her menstrual cycle, she is unclean. And anything she touches is unclean, okay? And must go through ritual cleansing. And to not or to do any of these things, even if it's out of ignorance, is a sin. This is what they taught, right? If you, if you don't keep it, even if it's out of ignorance, it's a sin. And sin separates you from a holy God. You cannot approach God in worship without repentance. So here's what they taught. Yes, Jesus saves you. But none of the Mosaic law goes away. And, and just for reference this morning, we are nowhere near keeping the Mosaic law. Okay? So think about this. The, the thought, as the gospel goes out and as it goes into Gentile areas... They are imagining that as the gospel goes, that each of those churches should become distinctively Jewish in custom and culture. Okay? You, you see that that's what that would look like. This is what the Christian Pharisees believed and taught. Now look at verse 2. Over this, Paul and Barnabas had great dissension. There's intense theological debate. And they argue and wrestle over it in the church of Antioch, and they get nowhere. And in fact, they decide they need to take it back to Jerusalem. Why to Jerusalem? Well, one, that's where it came from, okay? And they are presumably coming with the authority of the church of Jerusalem and James. And two, they needed to go back to the apostles. So that's exactly what they do. That's going to be quite a journey. Remember, traveling in those times, is, it's complex. And a group from each side is going to go back. They're going to continue the debate. Now, one more key piece of context as you picture this in your mind. What does it mean to go back to Jerusalem? Think about this. They're, they're leaving Antioch a Gentile city, and they're going back to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem where there's Jewish Christians who naturally keep the Mosaic law, right? They, they keep the festivals, the, the calendar, and, and the cleanliness laws. They've always done that. It's part of their culture. It's, it's ingrained in them, okay? <clears throat> so, here it is, and by the way, you need to hear me say this. It is not bad or wrong to keep kosher or the Sabbath day or to observe festivals. That is not bad or wrong. The question is, must you? Is it a sin 
not to. Because remember, sin separates you from God and it requires repentance. <clears throat> so verse six, the apostles and the elders that came together to look into this matter. And after there had been much debate, right? So you can imagine, you ever been a part of, of church debates? Okay, it's a fiery situation. You're patiently waiting your turn, just raising your hand. No, 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 right? People are shouting over each other. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up. Now remember Paul's chastisement of him in Antioch, okay? How Peter was keeping the peace at the cost of the gospel. Well, no longer. Because now Peter stands up and he said to them, brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. <clears throat> and God who knows the heart testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us. So in the middle of this tug of war debate, Peter stands up, and what he says here finally brings resolve to the issue. And what he says, he's referring back to Acts chapter 10. Remember the scene when Peter was in Joppa, and he went up, he was at Simon the Tanner's house, and he went up on the roof just to spend time in prayer. And as he was up there, God gave Peter a vision, okay? God did this. God was on the move. And in this vision, a sheet lowered, and on that sheet were all sorts of animals, clean and unclean. And an angel of the Lord said to Peter, kill and eat. And Peter resisted. He said, God, I have never Never in my entire life eaten one thing unclean. Why would I do that now? And in Acts chapter 10, verse 15, okay, because this happened three times, the angel of the Lord said, listen, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy unholy. And then the angel of the Lord said, now there are some people who are about to knock on your door. Go with them. And he does. And he goes to Cornelius's house. And this is what's shocking about the entire ordeal because Peter went to and into Cornelius's house, a Gentile, an unclean house. <clears throat> okay. He went and he stayed there. You would never do this. And he went into that house, he entered into that unclean space, and while he was there, and while he was preaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit of God fell. In that unclean space, just as he did upon the Jews at Pentecost. And Peter and his his group, he, he went with six others. There were seven of them. And they stayed there. And they had fellowship. Peter's going to get a lot of flack when he goes back to Jerusalem for this. All right? They meet him at the door and are like, why did you go eat in, with Gentiles? Okay, Because he, he saw it. He knew it. He realized, wait a second. The Spirit of God entered into that unclean space. Jesus has made us clean. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. Okay? And he pieces that together. So here, okay, so it's no longer about do not taste, do not touch, because God has made these things clean. So in the middle of this debate at the Jerusalem Council, Peter stands up, and this is the point he's driving home. Remember Cornelius' house, guys? Remember when the Spirit of God fell in that unclean space? And now he's applying it. Look at verses 9, 10, and 11. So, and God made no distinction between us and them 
cleansing their hearts, cleansing, see that word, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, he's going to press them. Why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke? Okay, look at the strong language. You are placing this burden, which neither our fathers, okay, nor we have been able to bear. Okay, later, Paul would use language that says, don't you understand that the law was a tutor that was to lead you to Christ and the freedom that's found in Christ? And, 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 and then you no longer go back to the tutor? Okay, why are you placing this yoke upon them? I don't know. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. And there it was, this mic drop moment in the early church where they recognized what the Holy Spirit of God had done. That through Jesus, God fulfilled all cleansing required in the law of Moses. And that you are no longer a slave to the tutor, no longer defiled by do not taste and do not touch. Now we are clean, washed by the blood of the lamb, by faith in Jesus Christ alone. You have been made clean. Last year, a Catholic priest in Arizona resigned after it was found that for 20 years, more than 20 years, he had said one wrong word while baptizing, a rite that he had practiced on thousands of people. Now, the, the one wrong word he, he said, he said, we, we baptize you, thinking that he was representing the church, the official stance from the Vatican is that you're supposed to say, I baptize you, and you have become Christ. The priest has become Christ, and you're saying it as Christ, okay? That one wrong word, the Vatican declared all of those baptisms invalid. Now, meaning, the theological implication is that they are not saved. And unless they get rebaptized, they are going to hell over one word used during baptism. Rubbish. Faith in Jesus alone is what makes you clean. You hear me? Faith in Jesus alone gives you the freedom to stand before a holy God made perfect with his righteousness as a free gift. No longer run back to forms of slavery. Listen, I'm not trying to pick on Catholics because there is lots of legalism to go around in every denomination, including Baptists, right? Lots of legalism where you take one thing and you make it law. Ever heard of Bill Gothard? Women's hair is too short. Men's hair is too long. You're not wearing the right clothes. You must homeschool. If you love Jesus and love you, you must homeschool. Let's get all, no secular music. I, I had someone testify of, of a CD burning that cleanse us from any of that stuff. There's plenty of legalism, guys, to go around where you take things and you make them law. I once had a head deacon who refused to show up to church because I had, for one Sunday, I had switched the order where I preached first and then we sang the three songs. <laughs> refused to show up. As if Jesus wasn't going to show up that day, right? Well, we can't worship God. God's not going to be there because he knows you have to sing the songs, then preach the sermon. <laughs> Beloved, Worship is no longer ritual practice in a particular location through priests with washings and killing of a sacrifice on the altar to atone for our sin. Instead, don't you understand? Jesus has atoned for your sin. 
He is the one who makes you clean. And now through Jesus, listen to the way Romans 12, 1 and 2 describes the way the new covenant in Jesus says we are to worship. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, okay, because of the gospel, because Jesus has accomplished it all for you. Listen to this. Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. You want to know how to worship in the spirit? You are a living sacrifice. Renew your mind. And what takes place, what's incredible about verse two here? It says, you will be able to discern. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, you will be able to discern what God's will is. Okay? Right, there's a freedom about becoming like Christ in the spirit of God. It's why at the very beginning, I asked you to pray that the spirit of God would convict you of where you need to repent in your life because when he convicts you, he heals you and he brings the freedom on the other side. Okay? Okay? So that you discern what the will of God is in spirit and in truth. All right, I got to finish quickly here. So after Peter stands up, after he gives his speech, verse 12 says, and all the people kept silent. And then Paul and Barnabas, they started telling stories, relating what signs and wonders that God had done through them amongst the Gentiles. And everyone listened. Wow, Spirit of God is doing this? Awesome. And in the verses 13 through 21, James, who's the head of the church of Jerusalem, he stands up and he summarizes what has already been resolved in the room. Okay? Now, I want you to notice just a couple of things. In addition to recognizing what the Holy Spirit of God had been doing and had showed them there, James also confirms with scripture because he stands up and he quotes Amos 9, 11 through 12. So he grounds their decision in recognition of what the spirit of God had done and this, the word of God. And he says, look, this has been God's plan all along, guys. You see that? Now, I don't have time to unpack this. This is a complete aside. I should probably not say this, but those of you that love to study eschatology, you study this week, and you go back and you look at this quotation of Amos 9, 11 through 12, and see the way that James uses rebuild the tabernacle of David to refer to the Holy Spirit filling believers, and then it makes you wrestle and work through end time temple in Jerusalem and some of those fun things, all right? All right, but we got to stay focused. Now some of you are, are ready to fight and you wanted to get into eschatology. Just stay focused, all right. So James stands up. He confirms what the Spirit of God has said. He grounds it in Scripture, okay? Notice when he issues the decree in verse 19, he says, we are not to trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. By trouble them, again, he means... Uh, requiring them to keep the law of Moses. And then again in verse 21, he says, for Moses is read in synagogues in every city and every Sabbath day. All right, but there's one final interesting piece, and that is what are we to make of verse 20? Because in verse 20, there are four laws that James does list that Gentiles are supposed to keep. Right, so in one sense, he says, do not burden them by forcing them to keep the law of Moses, but, they, but, but except for these four. Abstain from things contaminated by idols, presumably food, and from fornication, and from what is strangled, and from blood. All right, so what's going on here? Because honestly, this is an odd list. This is really odd. And theologians debate, right? 
Now, what's commonly taught is that these four things are food uh, laws that the Gentiles should keep whenever they're around Jews. That way, they could peacefully have meals together. That way, there could be harmony. It wouldn't be too offensive to Jews. The only problem is that second one there says fornication. So why would you list three things having to do with food and, by the way, don't have any sexual immorality? Now, what seems to make the most sense of what's going on here is that notice that all four of these activities were well-known pagan ritual temple practices. So sacrificing to idols and the pouring out, the strangling and the pouring out of blood. And sexual immorality, it was very common in the ancient world in pagan practices to have temple prostitutes involved in all of that. So the pairing here of these four would actually be easily recognized by Gentiles. And basically, let me rephrase it, it states this, hey, You can come to faith in Jesus, right? Come to faith. He's who cleans. But you must turn from your pagan lifestyle to Jesus, right? You can't keep going to the the temple and worshiping other gods. Salvation is a free gift. But you must repent. You must disassociate and Turn from your old lifestyle. Why? Because that's not who you are anymore. See, in the ancient world, the the local temple was the center of life and community, much like church was 100 years ago before we got so stinking busy. It's where you would go to be regularly seen and socialized, make business connections. It's the intertwining of, of social life, okay? So, This list against the pagan temple is not an easy checklist of, ah, all right, so I just won't eat food that's been strangled. It's a calling away from who you were to who you are now in Christ. Christians, Jesus has made you clean clean. Now, walk in that freedom. No longer under the chains of ritual cleanliness, some sort of ritual system, but a freedom to completely reorient your life towards King Jesus. By the way, a reorienting that doesn't just happen when you get saved but rather is what it means to be a mature believer. I had a woman in my office a few years back who came in all distraught, and she was, she, we, we sat down and we began to talk, and she's like, I, I'm becoming more and more and more aware of my sin. Am I saved? And a smile came over my face. Yeah, that's exactly what it looks like to walk with Jesus, okay? That's exactly what it looks like. Because to mature and to walk with him is to become more and more aware, right? Because you're giving him more areas of your life and of your heart, amen? So with that, okay, as we transition to the Lord's Supper, I want you to prepare the the bread, okay? As we said at the beginning, we do not want to take this in an unworthy manner. So I'm going to give you just a few moments, right? Repent. Repent before your king. If the spirit of God has convicted you of anything, Lay it down at the foot of the cross. And then we will take this together.
And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now as you prepare the cup, I'm gonna give you a few moments, but as you hold it and as you meditate, beloved, I want you to remember the freedom of being made clean by Christ alone. I want you to celebrate. I want you to leave here victorious, knowing Nothing can wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Would you pray with me? King Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you have accomplished on our behalf what we could never accomplish on our own. That your perfection, your entire life lived in righteousness and perfection has been credited to our account. And just like the woman in Luke 8, touching you makes us clean. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. May we walk in that freedom, in that cleanliness, in worship of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the praise team is going to come up and lead us in a final song, I invite you to stand to your feet and to sing with vigor and all the strength and energy that you have because King Jesus is worthy. If you need someone to pray with you, if you came in with a burden, I want to offer you, we'll have ministers down here at the front. We we would love to pray with you. We, We don't want you to leave here carrying that burden on your own. You're not alone. And so you respond.